think it looks really good. You are live. All right, there we are. Woo! Hello. Hello, everybody. Doing? Happy Wine Saturday. Wow. We got a lot of really, really cool people coming in. I know only mom the, and dad are here. Hi, mom and dad. Only the cool people are allowed in this one. <laughs> so we got a whole new setting here. Um, we're in Hollywood. We're in the Hollywood house and Mindy's really cool wall here. And man, we have a really excellent tasting today. We got a, a guest, Kevin Olmstead, going to come in. We'll introduce him in a few minutes. Um, but wow, this is special. It's one of our first tastings that we're doing with a guest and someone who knows far more about, yes, uh, far more about wine than I ever imagined. And he drinks twice as much as I ever tried. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah, I know. He's a professional. This is a professional you're about to meet in all ways. So please, uh, everybody, uh, this is an interactive. So chime in. We're going to ask questions. We're going to post questions up. So please go ahead and yeah, answer. Yeah. There's no wrong. An no, there's a lot of wrong answers, but still post them up because we'll goof on you a little bit. <laughs> and no, uh, this is good. This is learning for me because I love French wines. I love drinking them. I love learning about them, but it, it's always been something that's uh, eluded me, the, the details and everything. But let me just say before we bring in uh, Eric's friend, Kevin, and my friend as well, but he's his friend from working in the wine business. Kevin is so fun. Kevin knows more about wine than most of the people I know put together. And, and it's just awesome. So this is our first time having a guest on yeah. and this is exciting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we get to be in our little Hollywood house and have you guys with us and hopefully you're drinking something, but I'm drinking this. <laughs> so here we got, uh, we'll post some people's, uh, comments here. We got people coming in from Canada and Los Angeles. Saw that. Yeah. yeah smooth jazz family in the house. What vintage? Don't know what that question. Oh, hello from St. Louis. St. Louis, baby. Right, so I think Marilyn's here. Hey, Marilyn. One of the first questions we just posted, what are you drinking right now? Please share throughout the uh, the tasting what you're drinking. We're always interested in what people are drinking at home. And it is a requirement. This is not homework. <laughs> if you are on this live feed, you need to be drinking wine, well, beer or any spirits or anything else. But we prefer wine and we prefer Pinot and, and Burgundy. So please go ahead and chime in with whatever wines you guys are drinking right now. <laughs> Ooh, little Pinot Noir, I see, yeah. Yep, oh, what do we got here? Yeah. We got Bill. Uh, oh, geez, well, Bill's breaking out the crazy one, yeah. Uh, by the way, you can't see Kevin, he's off in the green room. He just gave a thumbs up, Bill. You just, you hit the uh, <laughs> the top level there. We all wish we were with you. You've made him happy, you've oh. made him very happy. Oh, we got someone with a little Bordeaux. We got uh, tequila mm. from Bob, that's nice. All right, Bob, I'll go with you on yeah. that one. It's well, a wine tasting, but you know, sometimes right. you gotta kick it off. That's all right. All right, so keep chiming in with whatever you're drinking. And uh, again, I'm looking down. Mindy will look at you guys a little bit more because I'm administering what you guys are saying and kind of going with the flow. Um, but one of the first things that we do when we start every tasting, either when we do it live, which will happen again soon, hopefully, or we do it together, is what? Cheers. Cheers. Here. So everybody, cheers. 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 Cheers to you. Cheers to Kevin, who's on the in the green room right now. Woo! Hey. Cheers and uh, everybody raise your glass and we're all together here. So thank you so much for being here with us. It humbles us. We have so many friends that come in and drink wine with us. So Well, it's fun. We've got our music nights on Tuesday and we drank beer for that last one with Peter White. So yeah. we have to, you know, get a little more wine in and we can drink wine with you guys on Saturday. So oh, yeah. it's good. Well, the, the thing is too, Peter doesn't know this. We're going to try to do another one with him. Maybe we hope. We'll yes. see. We'll see. Um, but it has to be English sparkling wine. So no more beer. He he might drink beer, but I'm going to have him taste English sparkling wine. So he, Great Britain sparkling wine is excellent. Now, different show, different time. So, well, no, you guys, you guys said you loved Tuesday night's session so much with me and Peter. And I think that's awesome. But I loved Tuesday night with Peter. I miss him. I miss playing with him. And it's, I, it's the first time I've had someone over to our house to play. And it was just, <gasps> it was so cool to just yeah. sit back and, and play with him after so long of not playing with 
anyone. So thank you guys for coming to that and supporting us and uh, and sending us PayPal donations. That was amazing. And yeah. it, it's just the whole thing. It was magical for me. Yeah. So uh, this, I just Very have to special. say thank you because a lot of you guys are the same ones who came to that. And Very special. we're going to do a volume two. So stay tuned. Um, we have a, a lot of new people coming in. So I just want to comment. Please tell us what you're drinking. We always love to see it. We got a ton of amazing wines coming up. Chapelet, Mirso, everybody drinks really, really well in this group, and that is awesome. You know what? So. It's a pandemic. You've got to <laughs> you've got to make use of it and drink good wine, right? Look at that one. Oh my God, Kevin, read this. For Kevin had to take his glasses. I know. I keep referring <laughs> to Kevin. He's in the green room when we could see him, and he's looking at what you guys are writing, and he's loving it. And that one, he had a squint. So anyway, one thing I want to tell you is for Wine Folly. I want to do a shout out, shout out to Wine Folly. If you don't know WineFolly.com, she is uh, she wrote one of the greatest wine books in the business, and we use a lot of her graphics on this. It's an outstanding site, probably one of the best wine sites. If you're a yeah. super geek or just learning about wine, I use it all the time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little music to look through who's drinking what, right? A little why who's uh -oh. drinking what music uh -oh. right mindy's going off uh, on off script people drink it very nice <laughs> very nice well while mindy was playing it was great it was a good transition to the next thing we're going to announce today which is before we have kevin on and start talking about burgundies here yeah. is uh adventures you know we put on world adventures we were looking to put our first one on in italy they're wine and music adventures around the world and i'm going to have mindy tell you a little bit about this one but we're announcing a whole year from now which we hope we hope by yeah. that point we can all get together it's uh, an intimate gathering in Sonoma, California this time next year. We just uh, announced it. So go ahead and I'll show these guys a little bit of the screen here while, uh, while we're doing it. Well, I'll, I'll take over, but you know what? We, uh, we've wanted to do adventures because we love going on all the cruises uh, with Dave Cause and the Smith Jazz Cruise and the legendary blues cruise. And we've been on so many of them. Uh, but we wanted to do our own adventures and we wanted them to be wine and music. So what better way uh, to start? Well, what better way to start than Italy? But that was not going to happen mm -hmm. this year. So I, I don't think we can make that happen. But what we can make happen is at the same time in 2021, as right now, we can be in Sonoma, California. That's where he lived for about 15 years in Healdsburg. And if you haven't been to Healdsburg or Sonoma, look up Healdsburg on the map, look at some photos. Well, you can look at our website to see, yeah. um, go to reserve tastings and just press on uh, adventures or go to mindyabear.com and press on wine and music adventures. And it's the most storybook town in America. This yeah. place is like a postcard. There are huge redwoods in the center square of town and every shop is just, amazing and cute and handmade stuff and incredible wines and art. And what are there, 40 restaurants in the surrounding like <laughs> five blocks? Yeah, about, and every one of them is is about as good as you can get in the world, so. They're yeah. nuts. When we started dating, he lived in Healdsburg and it was just done. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. you're kidding me. So uh, we're going there and we're going there because he knows it so well and he can call on all of his uh, friends and winemaker friends and, you know, guilt uh, them into having us into their wineries. We have friends that own wineries, winemakers at wineries, <laughs> owe me favors, you know, so. Uh, oh, they like us. They yeah. like hanging out with us. I'll uh, make some noise in the place and we're going to have, you know, some friends in to make music yeah. uh, that I can have some fun with and we can all drink and have a good time. So we've so. had fun making a, a cool schedule for you guys to, have an amazing week in Sonoma. Yep, and um, so just answering a couple questions. Yes, all of the information is found on our website, so please go to reservetastings.com or um, Mindy's page. All right, so uh, enough, I'll about, drink to that. enough about stuff we can't do for another year. Let's do stuff that we could do right now. 
Um, I'm for that. We're going to introduce, and I'm going to bring him in right now. He's looking all pretty in the green room right now. So <laughs> there he is, Kevin Olmstead. Wait, let me put your banner up. This is low tech. Low tech. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Nope, that's not right. <laughs> so wait, we didn't uh, we didn't cheers with Kevin. Wait, oh, here it is. Woo! <laughs> oh, couldn't get his name up. Hey there guys, go. here's a big here's cheers to you, guys. Kevin. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Always great to be with you guys again. Absolutely, man. Ever so, everybody. This is Kevin. Say hi to Kevin. Like I said, one of the wine, one of the biggest wine geeks on the planet, and uh, and he could do. Well, my brother's here, and he could do. Um, he could do no wrong when it comes to actually drinking a bottle of wine within a few minutes. I mean, knowing about a lot of about a bottle of wine within a few minutes. No, you meant drink a yeah, bottle yeah. of wine in a couple minutes. All right, All right. so. Um, Kevin, let me let me tell everybody a little bit about you that you're just not a neighbor that I hang out with, but you're actually a real wine guy. You're a 23 year veteran in the business. He's worked for wholesalers and wineries. He's uh, represented some of the greatest champagne houses in the world with me and on his own and wineries from dozens and dozens of countries. He's a certified wine educator for 20 years. And you'll see why in a second. And he's certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers for 19 years and he currently imports very small producer Italian and French wines. It's just awesome to go to lunch and dinner with him because he always brings the best wine. <laughs> Introducing Kevin Olmstead. Woo! Kevin! There we go. And, and just in case, just just a one clarification, I'm a certified sommelier. I'm no, nowhere near a master sommelier. That is the- Did I say master? No, 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 you didn't. I just don't want anybody out there thinking like, oh, that's a master sum. Um, that's an amazing. Kevin's a master sommelier times no. two. Stop um, it. No, he's not. <laughs> All right. So uh, great. Thank you for everybody saying hello to Kevin. So uh, we're going to start off at kind of a, a base level with Burgundy, and then we're going to raise it up to the geeky level. And please ask questions, but we're going to put um, something up. So where is Burgundy? Now, uh, understand there's a lot of people here that know where Burgundy is and there's a lot of people on this that don't know where Burgundy is and that's okay. So this is what this is all about. We're going to start where it is and we're going to work our way up. So please, uh, everybody kind of chime in. You know, you're welcome to just share your comments. Whoops, wrong, wrong video. There you go. Um, and Kevin, talk to us a little bit about where Burgundy is uh, on this slide right here. So Burgundy kind of sits just off the middle of France and you know, one thing to keep in mind when we're talking super step one is there is you refer to wine in France by its geography. Here in the U.S., we would refer to drinking Cab and Chard. When you refer to Burgundy, you're drinking wines from the Burgundy region, like you would refer to Bordeaux or Loire or Champagne. Those are all just going to be the names of the regions. So we're running uh, north to south, just off the midsection, um, in a little bit eastern part of central France. Right. Okay. And you you know what I love about this slide too, this slide, this picture kind of shows you that a lot of people think, and I did too, that Burgundy was a little bit more Northern and it really fits right in the center. The I call it the right side center. Some people might call it the East side center of, of the country. And, um, and Chablis is a part of Burgundy. And, and you, know, Bur you know, and I know that Gallo has not done the word Chablis well in the US. Yeah. But around the world, what does the word Chablis mean? Cheap box white wine. <laughs> <laughs> but to the people that really know Chablis, what does it mean? No, but when I go to a, a cool little place in France and I'm sitting eating my baguette and my brie and I order a glass of Sancerre, Sancerre. or Chablis, yep. it's kick ass. So why is that? Because if I buy it in America and it's it's an American company. It's not kick-ass. Okay. So um, keep in mind, again, with all due respect to Ernest and Julio, who launched an industry, you know, they, they capitalized on a word Chablis and Burgundy to, to sell some, some wine that they wanted to sell. But um, Chablis, for example, is just Chardonnay, but it's made in the most northern part of the Burgundy region, typically in soil that used to be oceanic. So you've got all these kind of shells and it's really kind of mineral-based soil. So true Chablis is very, very light, delicate Chardonnay. And whereas you also said you love Sancerre, Sancerre is a part of the Loire uh, River Valley, and that's where they grow Sauvignon Blanc, and it's got a lot of like that river minerality soil to it as well. So if you love Chablis and Sancerre, you like white grapes that most people are familiar with. You just yeah. like them in a much more delicate, restrained style. Yeah. 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 
And some of my okay. favorite wines are from Chablis. If, you know, we're talking about Burgundy here and mostly going to talk about Pinot Noir, but which when you talk about Chardonnay um, with Burgundy, and that's the next question we're going to come up here, what wines are, is Burgundy famous for? What two wines are really is it famous for? Um, Chablis is just by far one of the best places on the planet for white wines, especially if you're in a restaurant and you want to order something off the menu. All right, so everybody chime in here. What two wines in Bur is Burgundy most famous for, is the most famous for? You just gave us one. Well, I pretty much gave you both. I, oh. I'm not the greatest host here. I know a lot about wine. But. We're learning. We're learning. <laughs> we just like drinking and we like playing music, but and we like uh, having Kevin here because, you know, yeah, just he gets to answer all my cool, you know. No, no you're just, you just set him up, Mindy. I'll knock him down. Um, <laughs> you got uh, it. You know, a little, the great little part of Burgundy for so many Americans is so many people in the United States love Chardonnay and they love Pinot Noir. Right. Um, Chardonnay is historical, and then after the movie um, Sideways came out 15 years ago, and everybody jumped on Pinot. So red Burgundy is Pinot Noir, white Burgundy is Chardonnay. There are two other uh, grapes grown, Ali Gote and Gamay. They play a very very smaller role. But the, the big picture here is if you're drinking red Burgundy, you're drinking great Pinot Noir. And if you're drinking white Burgundy, you're drinking great Chardonnay. Okay, that that simplifies it. That makes sense to me. And I, I didn't really, I didn't know that. Mm. I just, I hear the word and it seems like a color rather than, <laughs> rather than a wine. Right. And, you know, this is also a really good po uh, part of our conversation to jump in. And I know everybody online here has done some kind of gardening and everybody loves to grow tomatoes or flowers or something. You know, grapevines, nothing, it's just a plant. And certain grapevines are gonna grow really well in certain areas and they're not gonna grow well in other areas. Like I live in a very hot environment where I can grow tomatoes, can't grow a bougainvillea to save my life. So Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are like kind of a cool to moderate climate. And the Burgundy region of France is very cool to moderate. Yeah. If you grow it in parts of Northern California where we're very warm climate, it will right. still flourish. But as we all know, the longer you grow something in a hot region, it just gets really, really ripe and big and sweet. So maybe one of the distinctions is a California Pinot or Chardonnay. That grape, that piece of fruit, it hangs longer in a warmer climate, gets more alcohol, gets bigger and bolder. Whereas Burgundy wines are a little more restrained because from a growing perspective, it's just cooler and they never don't get the huge ripeness. That makes all the sense in the world. Right. Okay, I love so that. Cool, that cool climate, cooler climate. Yeah. And just like in California, if you guys have visited Russian River up in Sonoma, warm days, cool nights, and some of those places, not too warm days in Russian River, but you get some of the greatest Pinot and Chardonnay in the world. Hey, I got a quick question, and this is what we do here because we're like, uh, you know, um, we're technically, you know, figuring things out. If there is an echo or a ring or something that's kind of coming off, let, let us know, guys, because then I can try to figure things out here a little bit. Okay? I heard it earlier, but it's it seems to be gone now. So I moved the mic a little further up. Oh, you did? OK, great. All right. But just let, let us know. Just keep chatting. Let us know if we could hear us, because that, that's what this is all about. And by the way, look at all these answers. So we got Chardonnay, Pinot, Chardonnay, Pinot. Everybody's outstanding. Chablis, Pinot. Yeah. yeah very Joe, good. CC. Yeah, you guys very know. Very good. All right, so this one is why is it so expensive? And not just why is it so expensive, but I mean expensive. No, it's why is it so expensive? <laughs> like the top is. end is really expensive. Well, yeah. But the low end is really expensive as well. So yeah. why is Burgundy so expensive when it can be even sold for $15,000 a bottle? So I've got a little picture up here, and I think this is something that Kevin sent to me when he was in Burgundy. Right. What you're looking at there is um, my wife and I spent uh, some time there a few years ago. And what's great about Burgundy is you can just walk through the vineyard. You can go on a hike for two hours through some of the most expensive real estate outside of Manhattan and Appleton and just take pictures like this and look at the rows. To answer your question, it comes down to a couple of things, supply and demand. I mean, there's X amount of Burgundy and people have been buying it for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's all small family farmers who just make so little of it, it really does come down to supply and demand. Yeah, so one of the things that Kevin and I were talking about before this, not a lot of people know this, but if you look at that picture right there, you know, in California, most, most vineyard owners will own big chunks of land or pretty sizable chunks. In Burgundy, you could have just those two rows owned by one producer. And it's very common just because of the way things have played out there after the, after the wars. So. 
it's so expensive primarily because of the supply, as Kevin was mentioned, it's just not there. And all these places have small, small, little, tiny amounts of wine. And then the other reason I think is because it's so damn good and, and it's so hard to make, right? Pinot Noir is not, we're gonna talk about Pinot after Mindy's uh, music intermission, but it's just so difficult to make a really good Pinot. Either you make it really good or it's just not very good at all. Where Cabernet, Zinfandel, Merlots can kind of be decent, Chardonnays, but with Pinot, I, I'm not sure if you agree with this, Kevin, but it's either really excellent or it's just a little tough to get through. Right, there, you know, there's a great kind of, I, I don't know what the exact expression is, like there's two Pinots, there's great one and ones that just underwhelm, those middle of the road ones. Yeah. Um, it's got really thin skin, it's that, you know, as a father, and you'll understand, Pinot Noir is just that temperamental kid, you've just gotta have, you know, really yeah, yeah. touch, um, and if you underdo it or overdo it, you're just gonna get a bad result. Mm. And a picture I just put up right now, this is one of the most famous brands in the world, if not the most famous brands of the world, is some of the Bordeaux houses of Latour and... and um, Margot. Yeah. Um, and what? California. But Romani Conti is a DRC, Domaine de Romani Conti, is legendary in the business. And as I mentioned, in some of the auctions, they can go for $15,000 a bottle. This picture right here could be a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of wine. So... It's a pretty astonishing number. But, you know, Kevin here in a little bit is going to talk about, I think this is going to be excellent. We're coming up to why we believe you could actually go out and get value in Burgundy. It's value for Burgundy, but we're going to show you some things, talk about some things that allow you to kind of find Burgundy in a more kind of our way. <laughs> you mean find the wines? Find or? the wines at places where you don't break the bank. You're not spending a lot of money. You're spending well mm -hmm. under $100 or $50 sometimes. See, to that's find cool because that's, that's realism. Yeah. You know, we can't go out and spend $15,000 a bottle on wine, even though that would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, but to be able to know all these little you know, all these little wineries and these little producers and stuff, that's only something that someone like Kevin would know. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna come up to that right now. I love this uh, part of our tasting, guys. I, I really do because as long as I know about wine, and like I said, Kevin is, is me times 10, the wine labels in France are flipping off, are just difficult to understand. Yeah, yeah. They make it really, really hard. As mo again, as much as I know about wine, I still look at the labels and get confused sometimes. So we got a really cool segment that I think um, people are gonna love here. I'm gonna put up a picture of, of wine, of a wine label from France, okay? Right. And let's walk through it, Kevin, because people really struggle with this. I know I do as well. Let me take down that little keywords. We'll do that at the end here. So go ahead and, and this looks like a very typical wine, French wine label, right? Kind right. of dry and, and goofy and informational and old. <laughs> when you approach this thing, you know, I, I always tell people, if you walk into a wine shop and on one side of the aisle, say you've got Australia and California wine and the label's in English and it says Chardonnay and you can look at that and understand it and you think, I know what I want to buy. And then you turn to the other side and you see a French label or Burgundy label. And after you've stared at it for four seconds, you turn it upside down thinking it'll make more sense that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it'll so, probably look the same to me, man. Or something. Right, you don't speak French. So um, they are a bit complicated, but like anything, once you peel it apart, that's where you'll get to. So the first thing before we kind of get to the label is to understand the classifications of how this is all done. So earlier, um, Eric showed a map of Burgundy and actually behind me, I've got the same maps uh, framed. They're just articulated in a different sense. That is South and that is North. So the entire, the main part of Burgundy, um, the Cote d'Or, the Golden Slope is just that. It is a North to South slope that goes from East to West. Right. Generally speaking, it goes like this. The finest vineyards within all of Burgundy, there's 32 of them, they're called Grand Cru's. And they're generally more toward the top of the hill. Um, and these are the most expensive grapes, again, on planet Earth outside of Manhattan and Africa. All right. So let me let me stop you there. So Grand Cru, and there's a cooler way to say it and for the people who actually could speak French, right? It's Grand Cru. <laughs> that's still not the best way to say it. <laughs> that's You're saying that's more the elevated vineyards uh, in Burgundy. Right. So Select. the Right. Fruit or any wine that comes off of the Grand Cru vineyards are going to be the kind of wines that few people on earth can afford and find. 
All right. And there's 32 of that now. Below that, then you kind of get to the B-level status. You get to the premier crew vineyards, right. which are really good, and they're more mid-slope. Mid um, wow. There's a lot of those. Yeah. And then after that, think of it as concentric circles, the smallest, most sought after the Grand. Then you've got some premier crew. Get the filet mignon. Burgundy is also made up of a series of villages. Then right. you can just get grapes from a certain village. And then you're, this is where we're going to get to in the value conversation. And maybe the wine is just named after the village. Or if you just have a blend of grapes from all the Burgundy region total, it's just called Bourgogne. And that's what we are drinking right now. Grand Vin de Bourgogne. And this was still a $70 Burgundy, right? Doesn't have to be. The, vill the villages or the villages are, are a lot, can be a lot less. This is an excellent wine, but uh, right. Yeah, so this is one of the greater area ones that we were able to get at k &L here in, in Los Angeles. Okay, so. someone asked, and I forget who asked, forgive oh, me, yeah. earlier for Grand Cru, they, they knew what Grand Cru was, but they said in California terms, you know, what do you, what's the, what's yeah. the equal in kind of California terms? Because, you know, a lot of us know California wines much more than French wines mm -hmm. being from America. That's so a great what, question. Yeah, what's the equivalent kind of? Well, if, for somebody who's looking for that, um, Grand Cru, remember, was classified hundreds of years ago for all certain kinds of reasons. Um, but if you look at historically and what truly puts out some of the best fruit, you can even look to the original Tokolone Vineyard from uh, Mandabi. You can look to a lot of the Santa Lucia Highlands, the Gary's Vineyard uh, uh, stuff up there within the in the Central Coast, right. um, and maybe even out along West Side Road in the Russian River. You look at yeah, West Side yeah. Vineyard. Um, well, and you know another another equivalent uh, example outside of Pinot is just think about Cabernet because a lot of people know about Napa cabs. So think right. about the Napa cabs that are up in in Howell Mountain or Spring Mountain or Atlas Peak. To Kevin's point before, those are all high, obviously, right? Mountains. Yeah. Yeah. And then down on the Valley floor, it doesn't mean that all of them are this way, but you'll get more of the Napa Valley uh, designation. They're still outstanding, but they're definitely not as expensive or sought after as a Howell Mountain, which is smaller up on the hill and just a little yeah. bit, a little bit of a different cut of the cut of the meat, you know? So, um, okay. So that was great. I love going through that. Um, our wine label here, Kevin said is way too early to drink as is 2014. And Kevin, what do you, what are you drinking today actually? Cause he's probably pulled out some rock star stuff. Like we have some people here. So um, what I'm drinking is from the village of Gevry Chambertin. So this village only grows red grapes. There's no white wine from this village. So the village is Gevry Chambertin, which has nine Grand Cru vineyards. It's got BRC within this village. Um, and then the, the vineyard is ranked Premier Cru, and the village and the vineyard is called Le Beau Saint Jacques. Hold it, so, up, uh, hold it up to the camera, like really close. Let's see, because we can see it. Yeah, yeah. A little higher. There you go. Nice. Hey, when's the last time I told you a little higher? Huh? Yeah. So this <laughs> is at the top of the slope, and it's only a Premier Cru wine. That's right. This goes back hundreds of years. Um, yeah. And this from the 2015 vintage, 2015, a um, very ripe, very consistent vintage. Um, so things got you know good, uh, good ripeness, and um, it's going to age really, really well for years. So this is going on four and a half years old. I think, two hours ago. It's awesome. All right, so I'm inviting everybody over to Kevin's house. He lives in the East Bay of Northern California. Um, he's got, uh, I would say, a refrigerator in his garage, but it's kind of like a dorm room that's air conditioned in your garage. And I'm assuming that it's got a huge dent in it since you've been home for a long time. So, yeah, a little bit. All right, so uh, over there. we're gonna we're working our way up to Mindy's. Um, Mindy's uh, intermission here. We're going to talk about food and wine, food and wine pairing. I'm Music. working my way to it. You know, I'm pairing. really I'm working hard for it. <laughs> well, Mindy works all the all Tuesdays, so, so this is one where Kevin and I have to do the heavy lifting. I work. All right, so um, two, two last things here. We're going to go through keywords because, again, we just went through the labels. So let's go through a couple things that we see in all these labels, right? But most people don't really know what they are. I used to manage Clos de Bois for a little while. And 99% of the planet, including me, didn't even know what a clo was. You see it on labels all the time. I still don't. So real quick, quick, and we went through a couple of these, Premier and Grand Cru, but tell us about a few of these words that you see on, on Burgundy labels or French labels in general. Right. The, the key to breaking down a French label is you don't have to learn French. You just learn the keywords. So you know who the producer is. 
and you know whether it's a Grand or a Premier Cru or a Village or just a general wine, the same way that a wine that says California was sourced from all of California. If you see the word clo, it just re refers to the word closed. So it came from one specific walled off vineyard. So clo means it came from a walled off vineyard. Um, another one on word you'll see a lot on, unfortunately a lot more expensive things is monopole. So monopole means there's a single owner of one vineyard and nobody else can ever draw fruit from it. So um, that's the great thing. I mean, that's stuck within a family. All right, so wait, so let me make sure I understand that. So on a label, if it says the word monopole, and did I spell it correctly, by the way? You did. <laughs> I'm not even saying yeah. it the names, but. Never spells it right, <laughs> never. I knew I got somewhere. Um, so that means that it's <laughs> one producer, one pick, one grower, all picked uniformly one producer. And, and that, that I should back up for 10 seconds and, and let people understand why that's meaningful. After the French Revolution, which essentially is when the, uh, the people of France rose up against the church and said, no, you don't get to own everything. It should be for the people. All the vineyards of Burgundy were turned over to the local farmers. And since the time of the French Revolution, the way that vineyards work is, let's just say initially one family owned it and then all the kids got married. So then the, 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 the vineyard ownership went down to then, okay, I had three sons. So now three families own this and each of them had eight sons. And so all of them, so what you could have, and you put up a great picture, Clos Bougeau is one of the most infamous uh, vineyards within Burgundy. Within that one vineyard, now after hundreds of years of what was called, again called the primogeniture laws, you could have 75, 80 families who each own anywhere from one to three rows within yeah. that vineyard. So you think about, what? you know, you think about some of the wealthier families, Kevin, too, you know, when they start infighting and when it starts breaking down amongst the kids and the grandkids, right. these become like crazy, <laughs> you know, right. legal bounds for fights. And it's amazing. So this one picture we're looking at, Claude Vigeau, Vigeau is that how you say it? Vigeau. 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 Mm -hmm. The way um, this one picture here could have hundreds, hundreds of owners from here to that chateau. Right? So anybody listening tonight? You might yeah. see uh, the wine, a very popular winery, Jadot. You will get Clos Bougeau from Jadot. You will right. get Clos Bougeau from small producers you've never heard of. Again, each uh, one of those rows is owned by somebody different, and each one of them has a different gardening or farming philosophy. The so two rows might be hedged and cut in a certain way, right. and then the three rows next to it look like Sideshow Bob from The Simpsons. Like, right. like old grow. Right. Imagine if you, uh, this is a great example. I get that visual. I yeah, like that. Right. So imagine if you have, if you're, uh, you know, for a lot of people on here probably grow, have a garden and you grow tomatoes. Now Kevin's got, you know, he likes cherry tomatoes and I like heirloom, you know, the bigger ones, whatever it is. Right. So we could literally have our tomato rows right next to each other and they cost thousands of dollars per whatever, a little foot of whatever we produce off of it. And we have to farm and produce our tomatoes differently. So that's another reason why it's so damn expensive because it's so hard to do it. But they all do it pretty well, you know. The wine's good. So they, what I was gonna say. Going back, exactly. So going back to the vocabulary lesson, if you see the word monopole, that never happened. One vineyard is owned by one producer, producer by which I mean one winery. All right, so Laura has a great question here. We're gonna talk about how you buy Burgundy and then we're gonna go on to uh, Mindy Plain because people only wanna hear Kevin and I talk about wine for so long, so. Kevin, uh, Emily is talking about Sideshow Bob, the fact that, you know, we're in a Burgundy discussion, totally oh, highbrow, oh, uh, highbrow, <laughs> you know, Burgundy discussion. He's like, one just looks like, you know, amazing. The other one looks like Sideshow Bob. And <laughs> a few people did catch that. Uh, well, not wait. just me. <laughs> Hold on, we got, a, we got another even a better t uh, comment here, Kevin. Uh, okay, that's my niece, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know how far we should go into this. I have never seen Kevin's tomatoes, just for the record. I, um, I, I'm, I, I'm assuming they're spectacular. I'm assuming they're amazing. I got a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> is this code? I don't, this, no. I don't know. No, no. I don't. Yeah, okay. okay. Let's go back to the question. Somebody like okay. team up to your, uh, to your idea. Laura <laughs> asked the best question there is. All right. The best place to purchase French, uh, it's not so much even French wine, but let's talk about Burgundy for a second. Um, there is Burgundy that is available pretty readily at a lot of retailers, but this is somewhere where I would really encourage all of you guys, everybody, you know, this may not be the time to go to Safeway or to Kroger or to ABC. 
find a local small wine shop. Find the people whose job it is for years in and years out to travel, to deal with vendors, to taste, and they kind of know for 5, 10, 20 years a really good litany of how the vintages have done. This is yeah. really where you want to trust a good wine shop and walk in and say, hey, I don't really know a lot, but here's what I want to spend, and I really kind of like this. It's a really good opportunity to start engaging a good small wine shop. Yeah, I think and a good wine shop for us is Kevin and I have sold a ton of wine to the big, big retailers. Like uh, we have a lot of people here from Florida, so Publix and uh, Winn-Dixie and Safeways and Kroger's and uh, HEBs for all you guys in Texas. But a good wine shop also could be Twin Liquors in Texas or A or Specs or ABC in Florida or Bev Mum. It could be Total Wine, by the way. Total Wine's got a very good French section. But right. But, and you can get, you know, the Jadot's, you can get 20, 30, 50, hundred dollar French wines there, Burgundy wines. But, you know, when you're drinking what Kevin's drinking right there, then you want to go to your wines. You want to go to your Wally's, your wine warehouses in Los Angeles. I love k &L. It's your down the street from our house here yeah. and, and they're your, awesome. Your Binnie's in Chicago, you know, yeah. every every place, uh, Gary's in New Jersey. You want to go to Primo, yeah. Wallet Creek. Yeah. Your neighbor walks into k &L. In New York. K &L. Oh, yeah, Morel's. New York. Our, yeah. our neighbor, George, walks into k &L. Uh, down the street from our house. We just walk there and they know him by name. Yeah. Like, hey, George. And they keep everything he buys and everything we buy on their computer. So if you like something and are like me and I forgot what it was and I walk in the shop and they're like, hey, Mindy. I'm like, what did I buy two weeks ago that was so good? It yeah. was red. It was from France. Oh, it sales, had a boring the... label. And they're like, yeah. Boom, it's this. And I love that. And I know different wine companies do that, but RKNL does. Sales reps in these high end wine shops are super geeky. Love it. We just bought a, like I said before, we bought an English sparkling wine. No, no, we bought this wine from KL. And Kevin, you'll love this. The sales rep came out, you know, because of social distancing. She came out to hand it to us in her car and she had a bottle of champagne tattooed on her arm, you know. So you know you're geeky. When your bottle, you know, Kevin, do you have a, any uh, champagne tattoos, Kevin, that we should know about? Inappropriate on your, on your tomatoes anywhere? Inappropriate no, Not in your forum, though. <laughs> not yeah. good. So once you find that retailer, once you find the people you trust, like any other time that you're exploring and discovering wines, um, you might have to kind of take a map in, but go in and say, here's the style of California wine I like. Here's the style of Pinot I like from New Zealand. Here's the style of Pinot I like from Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. And give them a little bit of a roadmap. Like you like it big and unctuous. You like it really restrained and, you know, really delicate and hard to figure out. And the sit in or the top saber. Right. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't be afraid to start with there. You can do amazing things with, for example, Macon Village. Macon is south of the Cote, uh, Cote d'Or. You can get a screaming value Chardonnay down there for $15 to $25. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and you know, work your way through it. Make it a process. Start kind of, you know, unwinding this knot a little bit by getting a couple of bottles every week and just going village by village. Um, Kevin, that was excellent. We went from kind of a high level all the way down. Um, and uh, we're going to have you back in for the Pinot Noir tasting that we're doing. But there is someone sitting next to me that most of the people here probably want to see more than you and me. No. I know I do. <laughs> So we're going to do a little wine intermission, wine and music intermission. But uh, before you go. It's a music what? intermission. This is a wine tasting. Right. It's, it's a, a wine music tasting. intermission. Music, music intermission. Um, like we do during Mindy's shows, we do the wine intermission. Yeah. But real quick, uh, everybody, uh, you know, please comment on what wine do you think goes with Pinot Noir, which is what we're drinking now in Burgundy Pinot Noirs. And so, Mindy, what wine, uh, what, what music do you feel music. with Burgundy Pinot Noirs? You know what? I I've always thought that that Pinot Noir is is more a a kind of heady wine, a, a thoughtful wine, and it, it's not just the fruit forward kind of stuff. So I, I you know I paired our Pinot Noir that that came out in ReserveTastings.com. Um, I paired ours with kind of thoughtful music. You know, it was music about what the world could be if we were good to each other. You know, or what, um, you know, what 
what uh, what makes the world a better place or yeah. just thinking about different things, humankind and that kind of stuff. So I really liked the more thoughtful yeah. songs. What, what we talked about when we created this label on the screen right here, Imagine, mm -hmm. which Mindy created this design, by the way, Kevin, I mean, she's an outstanding label designer along with being a great musician, right? Label. What we loved about this, this label was Imagine the song you know, the, it fits with Pinot Noir because it's incredibly difficult to make this. Kevin mentioned that before, but it can go in all kinds of different directions. It, it's a more of a heady wine. To me, a rosé is all about your heart. Champagne's all about your heart. It makes you happy. Yeah. Makes your heart, you know, sing. But Pinot Noir makes your mind think. So the words, the the songs like Imagine, um, that was one of your most, you know, watched YouTube videos. To me, fits Pinot Noir perfectly because it makes you think. So it makes you take over the world and think about things the right way, especially in today's world. So now I, I think that it's a perfect song for it because it's, it's simple. It's not like there's a bunch of grapes or a bunch of, you know, crazy stuff going on in a bottle of Pinot Noir. Uh, but it takes some, some thought to make it and, yeah. you know, and some doing. So yeah, we chose imagine for our brand, yeah. uh, our first Pinot no uh, Noir that we put out, which we've got another one coming for, yeah. for our later in this year shipment oh, don't don't spoil it so that's gonna have a different playlist but for our i can say first pinot noir which was imagine this made all the sense in the world so can i i play them yep. a little bit so we're gonna say goodbye to kevin for a second so we could put mindy up on the screen but bye kevin for now but for now party on drink heavily <laughs> um I love playing this song. I've always thought it's a beautiful song. I've always thought John Lennon is just one of our most incredible songwriters of all time. But uh, but yeah, it is it is pretty timely now too. Yep. But I did this version in my friend's living room, uh, and it was just you know it was just kind of off the cuff. We we just had fun. Yep. Um, Arlen Sharbaum. Uh, we were in his living room, and he was playing a B three, and we were just having a blast. And sometimes it's about that, just kicking back with your friends. But that video, I think, has over three mil three million yep. hits on YouTube, yep, which is does. just crazy. But it was just real and it was fun. So that's what I'm going to play for you now uh, without the band because it's me and him. We're the socially distanced ones. Do you need my, uh, room or are you good? I think I'm good. Is it uh, going to be super loud? No, I not, ear? not at all. No, you don't want that. <laughs> you don't want that. That's too much. Okay, hold on. I need... Uh, I need inspiration. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, I like that. Uh, what else, uh, while I'm playing, uh, any other songs you think pair with Pinot Noir, Burgundy, that kind of uh, thing, let me know. Yeah, but please for now, let, let us know. A little John Lennon with uh, our own twist on it, acapella. <laughs>
Smile always pairs with Pinot Noir. We had Come As You Are. Oh, wow. Pairs, you know, so we had some good suggestions. Here we go. Uh oh. A little Come As You Are. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> It's, you know. That's a great one. Yeah, my second Perfect. record. Nice. All right. Well, uh, we did a little burgundy tasting, and we did a little wine intermission. Does anybody else have any questions to ask Mindy while we have her here? Oh, for my music intermission. Come yes. on, bring it on. <laughs> They're asking you the wine questions. They're asking Kevin the wine <laughs> questions. They're going to ask me music questions. We got some applause for you too from Cheryl. And Thank you. Other people are coming in, George. And I know. did some yard work today, by the way. You guys were talking about tomatoes we're and growing talk about yard stuff. Work, really? And and uh, it was it this was like fun. super not sexy. Oh no, yard work is sexy. All right, well, go ahead. I mean, what are you supposed to do during a pandemic, right? Well, actually, was... I did look outside today, and it was pretty sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do in yard work, but yeah. You know. like no, but it's nice. You do some yard work. You you know trim the little lemon tree and all this kind of stuff. Then you come in and your husband has a bottle of awesome French wine for you. And so that's sexy. Yeah, it is. You know what else is sexy too? Out of the bottle of wine over there. No, no, you can't take it on your own. But we're still drinking this. How yeah. can we, yeah? Well, we're not gonna open it just what? yet. We got some more Petite Syrah, so. We do. Yeah, we got a little bit more. In this you put side. it in the store, right? We were out of it. We were sold out of everything. We yeah. were sold out of our Chardonnay. We were sold out of our um, our Petite Syrah. We were sold out of everything. Mm -hmm. And I got to thank you guys for that because, um, yeah. you know, what a crazy thing. We went into the pandemic and we were all ready to go on tour. We were all ready to get crazy. And yeah, absolutely the whole world came to its knees. So uh I needed wine. I knew you guys needed wine. So we didn't usually open up our little wine store, yeah. but uh, we did. And thank you for buying it. Yeah, we I mean, totally sold out. We just got more in. We yeah. just got more bottled, which was great. Um, so thank you guys for being so supportive of our wines and, and music and, and all of it. 
Yeah. So it's it's kind of a, a a cool thing. It's very special. So the for for those who don't know that Mindy owns a wine company with with me, and we go out and we find incredible wines from super high end winemakers that are you just can't find on the market. We get them for you find them. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And you taste them. So. Uh, we only choose eight wines a year. That's mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. And we go through hundreds. And then Mindy creates all the artwork for the label, like the Imagine we put up before. So it's all absolutely unique artwork on the labels, and they're all music and wine related uh, artworks. So we pair every wine style with uh, music, and it's different yeah. wines. It could be Pinot Noir, it could be Cabernet, it could be sparkling wine, Viognier, yeah. it could be Merlot, Melbecks. So it's a really cool, uh, you know, uh, membership if you're interested in buying wine. Um, yeah, it's and music. You it can be blues. It can learn. be jazz. jazz. It can be, be uh, yeah. You know, one of ours was harmony this past shipment, and yeah. it was all bands and you know, and artists that were all great harmonies and vocal harmonies, and it was such a cool playlist. Mm -hmm. Our neighbor Cheryl was like, "Oh my God, I loved that playlist!" And yeah. we just, you know, played it over and over. Um, but they ran out of wine before the playlist stopped. So they had to go into their second bottle of wine. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so we found that wine and music pair together, as you could tell with Mindy playing Imagine and Pinot Noirs. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do this with you guys as long as you support us. And we just can't thank you enough to allow us to do what we love to do in our, in our lives. My job was to manage big wineries. And now it's to manage our little membership. And I couldn't be happier doing that probably more than any big winery that I've ever managed. All right. So let's let's end this up. We were, we were almost an hour in. Let's talk a little bit about Pinot Noir. So um, everybody out there, please tell me um, what you're drinking. Once again, we have a whole bunch of new people that have come in. Well, I know we you started. finished your bottle already. Yeah, you, you probably mean. finished what, what you were drinking when you first came in. So tell us what you're drinking. <laughs> we're going to have Kevin come back in here. Kevin's pointing at something, so let's add him back in. We'll take him off mute so he uh, doesn't say anything inappropriate. Right? What? Kevin, say something inappropriate. <laughs> no history so, there. What were you? What were you pointing at there a second ago? No, I. You were mocking the fact that Eric had finished the bottle. And I was pointing out that I still had some left in mind. So I mean. <laughs> and we do, and we're, it's two of us, and you do, and it's only one of you. So uh, you know. And keep going. There we go. And scene. <laughs> you had a music intermission to drink in, too. Yeah, you had time to chill, right? All right, so let's just talk, uh, you know, this one slide that I'm going to put up about Pinot that I love. And this will be the last wine geeky thing we do on here. Pinot Noir is one of my, and I know Kevin's, and I know Mindy's favorite wines. Like I said before, though, it's either totally outstanding or it's really kind of okay. Is really, I like the good ones. Yeah, I like the good ones, too. She really loves the good ones. But, you know, the, the things about Pinot Noir that I love because it's so difficult to make, and I was I was very fortunate to manage a winery in Russian River one time called Gary Farrell. Oh, yeah. And Gary Farrell was one of the pioneers of Pinot Noir in California. But French, uh, the French figured out Pinot Noir a long, long time ago. In California, obviously, we took our time a little bit. We messed around with Chardonnays and Cabernets and other wines and the Gallows messed around with Chablis and whatever else they were goofing around with. But now we have some of the greatest Pinot Noirs oh in the God. world are grown in California, um, Northern California, where, where we live up there. But yeah. why? Because Pinot Noir is probably one of the most delicate and most beautiful wines. If you look at this taste profile right here, and again, I'm using wine folly because these things are excellent. This is pretty generic slide, but if you if you don't know Pinot, this is what you should be getting from it. The Pinot we're drinking right now, absolutely cherry, raspberry, mushroom, vanilla. And, you know, there, a lot of people ask me when we do the live tastings, can you really taste these flavors in wine? And, Kevin, the answer is absolutely. When you put your nose in this glass of wine that we're drinking right here, you can absolutely smell cherry. It's a brilliant thing about grapes that have this ability in wine. Yeah. to have these flavors and all in a very complex way, almost like a, a fine cuisine that you get from a restaurant, you know? Pinot is one of the grapes that will unveil, un, uh, kind of, un, it will show so many subtleties um, and you just got to let it open up. And yeah. even if you, in the other part, like burgundy, you will get an earthiness to it. And some people will smell earthiness and maybe they'll smell kind of a, a musty cellar kind of thing and think it's a bad thing. Um, Pinot Noir can show an earthiness that's lovely from a cool climate. 
but then you can get a little bit of a warmer climate, like maybe even Carneros or or, um, Rush or Sonoma Coast relative to Burgundy. And it's still not going to be overripe, but all of these flavors are always going to be a little more delicate and a little harder to find. But man, it's so worth kind of like peeling back that onion. And, you know, one of the, to, to Kevin's point right now about the complexity of it, Louise has an excellent question. Can you see that on the bottom there? Not question. She's making a statement about Mendocino. Absolutely. Pinot Noirs, which, I, you know, Kevin, right? Yeah. Mindy, some of the best Pinot Noirs in the world. I would rival Burgundy and some other places in the world to me. Yeah. It's a cooler climate. Remember, Pinot Noir is a delicate grape to grow. It's a delicate grape to work with in the winery. Generally speaking, in the cooler climate, so think about it, Oregon is cooler because it's further north, right? The coast of California is cooler because it's on the coast. So the Mendocino, the Ukiah, the Sonoma Coast, that Russian River Valley where you get all of that coastal air that keeps things cool, that's really where you're going to find the longer you can grow Pinot on the vine in a cooler climate so it develops without getting too big. Um, you're, it's really going to pay off in the long term with n absolutely utterly no disrespect to people who grow Pinot in warmer climates. Um, I just think you just, you, you miss the boat by overcooking it. This is yeah. one of the things that you want to underbake and not overbake. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? This is a, that's a, that's a great analogy. So okay, will you give me a couple, uh, I'm just going to ask, you know, as a, a saxophonist here, I play saxophone. Um, you guys are wine experts. She knows wine really well. Don't 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 uh, these people. <laughs> I mean, I've got my favorite Pinots because you lived up in Healdsburg, you know, right. for the first couple of years in that Sonoma, we were dating right. uh, in Sonoma. Right. But uh, you know, we would take our little trips down to Russian River and and uh, goof off there. I loved Papa Pietro Perry. Um, I, you know, there's some Russian Damn River straight. Pinots that are amazing, but uh, and Gary Farrell is amazing too. Oh my God. But what are some of your favorites or, you know, if you guys are watching, give me some of your favorites. Cause I just know what I know or what I've been, you know, accustomed to, I, you know. You yeah, So some of the favorite wine, wine brands? Yeah. Pinot. Oh, Pinot yeah. Noir. No. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, would, uh, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'd say I'm, I, I early on when we first logged on and people were saying, what were they drinking? Somebody had said they were drinking Joseph Swan and whoever that is out there. Joseph Swan and the original founder of the Rocchioli family. I don't know if it was John or Tom Rocchioli. So both the Swan and the Rocchioli families are credited yeah, yeah. with what's referred to as luggage uh, varietals, where they smuggled in vine cuttings from Burgundy in the 60s, and they planted them in the Russian River Valleys. And I'll tell you something. You, if you find yourself a Joseph Swan, a Rocchioli, the old school yeah. guys and families growing in the Russian River Valley, those are beautiful wines. Yeah, okay, I agree. Cool. And, you know, we found that little winery Mindy's mentioning called Papa Pietro Perry. It's based in Dry Creek, but they make all the wine in a Russian river. It's probably one of the best under the radar Pinots. If anybody has any questions, you know, email us at reservetastings um, at gmail.com. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll send you this. Papa Pietro is light out outstanding so good. all small lot little vineyards there's another one called talisman all they do oh, yeah. it's based in edna valley in sonoma all they do is pinots another place they have like 10 now they get crazy with all these little yeah. small lot pinots so talisman is another one um kevin we got a, somebody here asking a lot of questions about um uh where we used to work for a winery in sanford there we go um, you know, Santa Rita Hills, sorry, right. Santa Rita Hills. Santa Lucia. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Santa Rita, right. Right. So Santa Rita, for everybody who doesn't know, is way south. It's in Santa Barbara County. So if you think about Sonoma and Napa, which is way northern California, it's a eight hour drive, almost a seven hour drive from there all the way down. And yeah. Santa Barbara County is making some incredible Pinots. Uh, yeah. Sea smoke is from that area as well. I love their um, label. I'm just being a yeah, girl right yeah, now, but yeah. that sea smoke label. I love the wine too, but I the agree. label's beautiful. I, I couldn't agree more. It's probably one of the best labels out there. But Santa, what there's one characteristic that Santa um, Santa Rita has a, a going for it, and what is that? It's even though it's in Southern California, which is considered warm. So for me, Santa Rita Hills. There, there was such exposure to the ocean in the Santa Rita Hills. Mm. You would always get these winds that would come through the Santa Rita Hills. And here's what that means. 
is the more you stress and literally beat up a, a grapevine, when you stress it, it starts to shut down to protect itself. And so wind and cold will make a, a, a vine shut down and produce less fruit, but produce better fruit. So all that wind screaming through the Santa, uh, Santa Rita Hills um, really, really stresses out those vines. You get really, really low yields. And so just the concentration of flavor down there, um, it kind of led to its own kind of perfect storm that yeah. made great wine and everybody wanted it and everybody wanted it and made great wine and there was less of it. It's pretty amazing. We have a couple of people, one of our friends is on here from that area and you know, you could have a super warm day, it could be 90 degrees, and you could see that fog rolling way in Valley because it all, even though it's Santa Barbara County and everybody believes that's a warm place, you and I know both know we've, we've uh, rolled, uh, crawled out of restaurants <laughs> at night, and it's pretty damn cold out, and it could be August. So, um, right. So it's one of our favorite areas for, um, from Pinot Noir's. And uh, I'm looking here, guys. Oh, you guys uh, definitely want to go out with them at night because, yeah, you don't just walk out of a restaurant. You you stumble a little bit. <laughs> so, OK, so there's a person here by the name of Jacqueline File. I don't know who this is. Or oh, some other person, Jackie. Jackie. Um, <laughs> she's antagonizing us a little bit with this, you know. But Keep antagonizing them, please, Jackie. <laughs> One of my favorite people on the planet. What's up, JP? And one of our favorite wines, Failure. All Yay! right. So um, thank you, Kevin. We just want to say thank you so much for spending this hour with us uh, and dealing with our technical challenges and working with us and uh, doing one of our first kind of um, co-tastings here and could not enjoy having you in here more. Um, but Kevin also is a geek with champagnes, oh, yeah. Bordeaux, and he can geek out with me in California wines. So just like Peter White and I are going to do a volume two, you, we may do a volume two with uh, the wine. Yeah, yeah, you know. So um, thank you so much for tasting. for being here with us today, my friend. We love you. You're one of the greatest people on the planet to us. So, Thanks for having me, guys. So good to see you guys. I love you too, Mindy. I don't know how you put up with him, but you're a saint. <laughs> in the bottle my friend it's in the bottle you know we've seen your wife she's hot too <laughs> you know all that liquor you have behind you we know keep her sedated she'll love you i just hope wow. i hope everybody realizes what you guys are bringing to the table between your experience in making wine and creating brands her her music i mean to have a wine club and to have the kinds of experiences you guys are bringing forward sign me up anytime man <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, brother. We love You're you. You're part of the family. We love you. Bye. Right. All right, everybody. Well, Mindy, do you have anything to say to everybody? We have so many people that have just hung with us for this whole hour for this amazing Burgundy and Pinot tasting. We drank the whole bottle. I would say I drank most of it as you were playing. No, I drank a lot of it before I played. <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you. You know, you come for our Tuesday nights. Uh, obviously, we can't be on the road right now. No. Uh, you know, it's just not that kind of a party. But we're trying to create music for you guys that um, is safe and that isn't going to hurt anyone or, or hurt us. So I've got a few things that I'm working on that I think you guys are really going to enjoy. And uh you know, I'll just keep posting them. Make sure you follow me on Facebook. Make sure you follow our wine company, Reserve Tastings, on Facebook or Instagram, um, because we're going to do more of this stuff because it's our way of connecting with you guys. To drink wine with you makes us feel normal, makes him feel normal to talk, you know, all the geeky stuff about it. And then for yeah. Tuesday nights, it makes me feel normal to play music for you guys. And I'll keep doing it with people I love when we're allowed to be together, which is awesome. So um, I want to play. Someone asked for um, smile. Sure. Uh, so sure. I got nothing. You know, to, I got nothing to do now. Let's do it. You know. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I, you guys have well, you guys have asked for a couple songs. So yeah. you know, I take uh, requests. No, but right? I saw I saw a smile. So let's let's do it. Okay. Uh, uh, that's awesome. Um, Jim said, it's one day closer to when you'll be on the road and one day we will be on the road. Yes. But for now, this is how we get to, to yes. be. So that's kind of fun. Yes. So um, cheers to you guys. Thank you for coming. I'm just going to play us out with a little music because that's what I do. Well, I got to put up your um, banner. A little banner? Yeah. What? 
All right. You put start playing. Banner. I'll put up a banner. All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Right. Cheers. Cheers. here we feel like we should hang with you but we should probably go right we're gonna let you guys go we know you got stuff to do uh right. you've got tomatoes to plant you've got wine to drink but uh thanks for hanging with us oh and that's right we had a tomato reference tonight uh yeah a couple mm -hmm. one inappropriate a couple inappropriate hmm. yeah all right we'll clean it up next time <laughs> no we won't no no <laughs> all right well thank you guys cheers everybody we love you see you next time cheers cheers <laughs>